uh, right around the year 600, that Pope Gregory, who go down, goes down in history as Pope Gregory the Great, uh, there was a whole bunch of Pope, pope Gregories. He was the first, but he taught a list of seven things that, that he felt were the deep, inner, core attitudes that seem to be the root for so many other sins. And these seeds planted grow into monsters in our lives. This is week four, and we've looked at pride and greed and envy so far. And, and amongst all of the things we've talked about and learned through this, one of the things that I've seen consistently through this is that all of these start with, they start with my own attempt to, 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 to satisfy what I need. My own attempt to satisfy what I need. Uh, we all need happiness. We all need satisfaction. We all need a, a, a self-identity. We need uh, comfort. We need contentedness. We need safety. And when I pursue these things my own way, with me at the center of this, when, when, I'm, when I'm pursuing real life my own way, when I'm, when I'm trying to get for myself the things that God promises he gives us when we surrender. The truth is, if I summarize the last three weeks, at least in my own mind, uh, these seven sins are called the deadly sins because they go against the root of Christianity. What I mean by that is, uh, at its root, God is in control. God is love. And God provides what we need. And so these seven sins all go against that because I, I, I don't trust God 100% with everything. And I start to, to, to clamor for those things and collect those things. Uh, to put it blunt, uh, in this case then, I'm living my life in the opposite direction of God. I'm actually living my life in an opposite direction. They're deep attitudes that produce a long list of trouble. Now, I want the things that Scripture tells us are promises from God. As we surrender to Him and He promises us love, He promises us life and peace and contentedness and freedom. He promises us safety and satisfaction and purpose and comfort and hope. I want these things. Do you? But my world around me tells me that I have to clamor and get those things. That I have to work. I have to fight for them. And when I feel that, when I get that, I want to do everything I can to not let that go. That is a dead end road. There's so much work and stress and trouble struggling for life. Struggling for happiness and fulfillment and, and plenty. Well, let me tell you, there is a different road that leads to life and peace and fulfillment and plenty. How many of God's ways are 100% opposite direction of our instincts or, or our, our nature or just left by default we'd make these decisions? One of those is, is in with money, the use of our money. A clear, obvious thing because... Um, our instincts, our human nature tells us that when I get paid, I have to pay my bills, I have to put my food on the table, and I need every penny in order to get by and to do the things I need to do. But what's God's way? God says, put his first and honor him first with the tithe. And, and, and when we put him first and seek him first, th then all these things are added unto us, right? Right? It's the opposite of my nature, though. It, it drives my fears because we don't trust. The groceries have to get paid first. The rent has to get paid first. That's not God's way. It's honor God first. 
And those of you who live this way know for yourself the blessing that comes from that. There is a road that leads to life, to plenty and to fulfillment. And there is a road that leads to bondage and being bound up and tied up and locked up and, and enslaved. That's not the road that leads to freedom. You see why over the last few weeks and in the next few weeks, I want us to really look at these things and understand them. To really understand these sins so that we can examine ourselves. To really dig in deep and even find the hidden parts. To really self-examine and then expose it. Get it out in the light. Sometimes we need to let other people know because that's the best thing we can possibly do to deal with the shame and the secrecy and actually get it out but, but in surrender then, and in repentance, to find freedom. To run to Jesus and find life. Well, we're halfway through this series now. And uh, I wanted to just take that time to just kind of reset the table, revisit that and reestablish those kind of things. But today I want to look at another one. Uh, another one that is clearly a trap. It is full of lies. We become tricked. Uh, because our own pursuits, and it lies to us. If you have a Bible, go to Second Samuel chapter eleven. That's where we're going to start. Um, in Second Ch- Samuel chapter eleven, uh, we are reading about David here, and David is king. And uh, permit me, as we go through this, to read between the lines a little bit. This is one of those stories, as many are, that is super compact. And as I read it, knowing David, knowing David's heart and David's character and David's integrity, it has to have taken a lot more time than this, these couple of verses. Boom, 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 boom. So I, I, allow me to read in between the lines here a little bit. Uh, we, we see David here first. Um, it says in chapter 11, In the spring of the year, when kings normally go out to war, David sent Joab, the Israel army, to fight the Ammonites. They destroyed the Ammonite army and laid siege to the city of Rabbah. However, David stayed behind in Jerusalem. And late one afternoon, after his midday rest, after his afternoon nap, David got out of bed and was walking on the roof of his palace. Wouldn't it be nice, one, one thing to live in a palace, to be able to have a nap after, every afternoon, but then to have a terrace, a patio on the roof of the palace. Think of the view from there. He could look out over the whole city. He could keep it all under his eye. But the thing that really captures my attention here is that David didn't go to battle with his army. Kings led their armies in battle. And when they came back victorious, kings led the victorious parade back into town. And, and this time of year is when the kings rode to battle, but David didn't. Now, I could probably think off the top of my head... Uh, a whole bunch of reasons why maybe David didn't go. But David ended up in a place of great temptation. Look at verse 2 and 3. Late one afternoon, after his midday rest, David got out of bed and was walking on the roof of his palace. As he looked out over the city, he noticed a woman of unusual beauty taking a bath. He sent someone to find out who she was. And he was told she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Iliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Let me stop there. How much time do you think happened between verse 2 and verse 3? Think, David is a man of God. David is full of integrity. His values are solid. He is a godly man. We see that all the way through Scripture. And yet to think that David would be on his terrace and see somebody, right? And then say, who is that? Here's what I think. Now, again, this is just, this is the Dave Brotherton version of of the Bible reading between the lines here. I think knowing David's character, he was probably up there one day and he was looking around and saw her clearly caught his attention, maybe pondered a minute or two and watched, but then boom, He knew, and he ran. But the next day, when he was up there having his tea, and the image of what he saw yesterday popped up into his mind, 
and he just happened to take a quick look. How many days? Right? Now, now I, I have a hard time believing that it was just all one boom, 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 because we know the integrity of David. Now, if David was a king that was pompous and arrogant, like a lot of the other kings, who I am the authority, I get what I want, I do what I want, I could see him standing up there and looking around and saying, who, who's that? Go get her. Right? But that's not David. There's nothing we see of David that is like that. Um, We don't know how many days this took. But what we do know is when David saw her, a seed was planted in his heart. Something ugly was planted in his heart. And we know that he didn't deal with it. He allowed it to simmer. And it doesn't matter why. Maybe he had issues. Maybe he had brokenness. Maybe he, he, his, his wife wasn't satisfying him. Maybe this. We can list all kinds of things. That doesn't matter. The truth is, even a deep man of God, a seed was planted and he let it take root instead of blasting it out of there. That seed was lust. For, what, for whatever reason, he let it grab him. And if he was like us, chances are he went back to the rooftop and had another look another day. And here we've got a man of God acting like a creep. A man of God acting like a predator. Everything to do with lust is creepy. There's no other way of looking at it. It doesn't matter how secret it is or how buried it is or when no one else is around. It's a seed that's setting its roots and it sets its roots broad and deep long before the little green shoot pokes out of the soil. A friend of mine out west, Ron Gray, is a pastor and and, uh, he told this story of one summer when he worked on a construction site as a summer student. And um, as a summer student, you get the worst jobs, right? So he carried a shovel all day long, and he's digging all, all day, all day, all day. And on one ridiculously hot day, by 8 in the morning, it was already way too hot to work, and he's shoveling. He had forgot his water bottle. And so by 8 in the morning, he's dying by 10 Right by 11 o'clock and 12 as it's getting hotter and hotter and hotter. Um, He had no access to water. And even if there was a hose there, how many people would not even drink from a hose? But a hose would look pretty good compared to the only water that was around, and it was this ditch that had this gross standing water in it. And at 8 in the morning, that ditch, there's no interest in that water at all. But by 12 and you're dying in heat, by two o'clock in the afternoon, when you're feeling faint and gross, that water, even though I know it's not good for me, even though I know what it's going to do to me tomorrow, and who knows what else, the lies start to become a little bit more inviting. And so by two o'clock in the afternoon, he, he had given up and he decided, I'm going to go and fill my water bottle. And he went over to the ditch and filled his water bottle and it was completely gross looking. So immediately he had second thoughts. Whew, good, right? He put it down for a while and then later looked at it and it was starting to separate. And the top inch or two looked pretty clear. And so he said, well, it can't hurt if I just take the top inch. So he took off the top and started sipping on the top inch, and then all of a sudden, gulp, 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 gulp. And at that point, it didn't matter how bad this was. He knew how bad it was, but it didn't matter. Here's the thing. Lust compels us to drink deeply in things we know are not good for us. 
It compels us to drink deeply in things we know are not God's plan. They're actually in opposition to God's plan and who God is. It, it compels us to drink deeply in things we know is dishonoring to God. Things we know are dishonoring to our families. Things we know are, are dishonoring to ourselves. And lust can be for almost anything. Lust can be for power. Lust can be for, for happiness. We can lust for satisfaction. We can lust for peace in my life and in my heart. We can lust for, for money. We can lust for control. We can lust for uh, significance. We can lust for security. Lust is being consumed with desire. Craving, coveting, wanting, wishing, longing for, yearning for, hungering for, thirsting for, aching for, burning for something that I think will fill the hole or the wanting in my life. See how closely related that is to greed and to envy and to, to pride? Clearly, though, lust can be for anything. We can lust for any of those things, but clearly lust carries the connotation, connotation of, of sexual desire. Burning for something to fill a hole in my life. You know the story of Joseph's life, right? Genesis, the second half of the book of Genesis. Go to Genesis chapter 39 if you have a Bible. Joseph, uh, growing up as a child, um, lo his father loved him to death, but his mother died when his younger brother was born, when he was just a kid. His brothers hated him. They were ridiculously jealous. His brothers clearly made the statements that they did not want him. He ended up being sold to traveling merchants who likely auctioned him off as a slave in Egypt. He was purchased as a slave in a foreign country. So here he is, broken and hurting, and now he is lonely and afraid and lost. Yet, um, he worked hard, and he was full of integrity, and he was successful. He was God-honoring. He was a stellar student, uh, a citizen. But he's got some deep inner wounds there. In that brokenness, there was an enemy that lies to him with the answers to all of the things he needs. An enemy who wants to take him down and Satan launches a plan to destroy Joseph. It's Genesis chapter 39. When Joseph was taken to Egypt by the Ishmaelite traders, he was purchased by Potiphar, an Egyptian officer. And Potiphar was captain of the guard for Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. The Lord was with Joseph, so he succeeded in everything he did as he served in the home of his Egyptian master. Potiphar noticed this and realized that the Lord was with Joseph, giving him success in everything he did. This pleased Potiphar. So he soon made Joseph his personal attendant. He put him in charge of his entire household and everything he owned. From the day Joseph was put in charge of his master's household and property, the Lord began to bless Potiphar's household for Joseph's sake. All his household affairs ran smoothly. His crops and livestock flourished. So Potiphar gave Joseph complete administrative responsibility over everything he owned. With Joseph there, he didn't have to worry about a thing except what kind of food to eat. Joseph was a very handsome and well-built young man. And Potiphar's wife soon began to look at him lustfully. Come and sleep with me, she demanded. But Joseph refused. Look, he told her, my master trusts me with everything in his entire household. No one here has more authority than I do. He has held back nothing from me except you, because you're his wife. How could I do such a wicked thing? It would be a great sin against God. Well, she kept putting pressure on Joseph day after day, and he refused to sleep with her and kept out of her way as much as possible. One day, however, no one else was around when, she, when he went to do his work, and she came and grabbed him by his cloak, demanding, Come on, sleep with me. And Joseph tore himself away, but left his cloak in her hand as he ran from the house. When she saw that uh, she was holding his cloak and he had fled, she called out to her servants, 
And soon all the men came running. Look, she said, my husband has brought this Hebrew slave here to make fools of us. He came into my room to rape me, but I screamed. And when he heard my scream, he ran outside and got away, but he left his cloak behind with me. She kept the cloak with her until her husband came home, and she told her story. That Hebrew slave you brought into our house tried to come in and fool around with me, she said. But when I screamed, he ran outside, leaving his cloak. Well, Potiphar was furious. When he heard his wife's story about how Joseph had treated her, so he took Joseph and threw him into the prison where the king's prisoners were held, and there he remained. <clears throat> now, just Joseph here isn't the one uh, who that, that seed of lust didn't grip his heart. But, but this story shows us some of the nature of lust, the character of lust. And the first thing is that lust pursues you. Lust is a predator by nature. Actually, lust pursues us all, men and women equally. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what age. It's all the same. Maybe it expresses itself differently, but it pursues us all the same. We don't need to even talk about statistics for pornography because it's, it's over the top. It's so accessible, but it's not just men. The statistics actually, actually are equal for women. And it's not just pictures or not just computer, but TV shows and movies and maybe even the books we read are a lot more subtle. But it's pornography. It's pulling in a different direction and not God's way. It's pulling us towards not being faithful. It's pulling us towards not being pure. And it takes all kinds of different faces. But let me say this. Sexual desire and sexual attraction is a gift from God. It's hardwired into us. And when we love in the nature of God, it in, we, we express deeply within his plan, then it's rich. But in our world, it is so messed up completely by the fall. That right and pure desires have been twisted around into lust that kills and destroys. Lust is one of the most aggressive, demanding things that we can plant in our heart. Whether Joseph was the one here who was lusting or whether he was the victim, whether Joseph sinned or not, what happens here is Satan knows Joseph and knows Joseph's heart. He knows Joseph's weaknesses. He knows his brokenness. And Satan jumps in with lies and launches a plan to destroy Joseph. And that day, that day, Satan won that battle because he put Joseph in jail. But as Joseph dealt with this situation in purity and integrity, it says in verse 21, the next words are, but the Lord was with him in faithful love and he made Joseph uh, prosper even in jail. God was with him. So we see lust pleads with us. Lust uh, argues with us. It reasons with us. It tries to make it look... Uh, logical. It lies to us. Lust berates us. It makes us think, how can it hurt to just drink the inch of water on the top of that water bottle? Lust gives us answers for the things we're longing for. Whether consciously or unconsciously, it says, come and get it. Lust offers all kinds of answers. Lust promises everything, but lust steals everything. All of us, we all have unique scars, unique needs, unique voids, unique issues and problems. Joseph had his too. And lust comes and whispers to those things. I can meet you here. I can provide that. I can fill that void. I can soothe that craving. And we're tricked into thinking that we can actually fill the void that's in our heart 
consciously or unconsciously, the void that only God can fill. Satan's plan is to steal and destroy. But your heavenly father has a plan too. You want to find freedom from lust? Here's the first thing that I see. We have to see lies as lies. We have to know the difference between truth and lies. And when we know it's a lie, the whole perspective changes. But, but we don't know the difference unless we know the truth. There is a very real enemy. Satan is crafty and smart and strategic. And he's in the loop about the inside workings of your mind and your longings. He knows it and he wants to destroy you. So he has mapped out your territory. He has created a strategic plan of, effect, uh, of attack on you very skillfully. He knows where you're broken. He knows where you feel shortchanged. He knows where to pick at and when to do it. He pinpoints his attack on us. And he has a plan to get you to walk yourself right into destruction. Can you see lies as lies? Or are we duped and deceived? A couple of scripture verses here. John chapter 8 verse 44 says, He was a murderer from the beginning. He has always hated the truth because there is no truth in him. Whatever he lies, it's consistent with his character for he's a liar and the father of lies. This is how he works. We've got to understand the difference between the truth and the lies. In 1 John chapter 2, uh, John writes, So I am writing to you not because you don't know the truth, but because you know the difference between the lies and the truth. In Psalm 119.11, hide God's word in our hearts. Why? That we might not sin against you. One of the ways the Holy Spirit works is when we are faced with temptation, the Holy Spirit will dig through the recesses of our brain and bring those scripture verses that we have memorized right to the front, right in the perfect time. But do you know that surveys tell us that across Canada and the United States, 90% of Christians don't read their Bibles? How in the world can we use scripture to fight off the enemy? How can the Holy Spirit grab it and pull it and put it right in the front so we, at the right time if we don't know it? How do we know the lies if we don't know the truth? And a little bit of a half hour on Sundays isn't going to do it. This needs to be at every day, all the time. We need to be inward and we need to know the truth. Ephesians chapter 4 says, Then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown to, like, about by the wind of every new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever that they sound like truth because we know the truth. The second thing is it, 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 we, see that we see in the difference between how David uh, dealt with this in his huge failure and how Joseph dealt with this and landed with strength and integrity. Both of those had effects on the whole rest of their lives. But in, 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 in Genesis 39 that we were reading, in verse 10 and in verse 12, it tells us that Joseph stayed away whenever possible. He kept it out of sight. It says that when she grabbed his coat, he ran. I think this is an important second thing. We need to avoid the places where we're tempted. We, need, we know the things that trigger us and capture us. We need to get away. We need to avoid those things. Guys, when you're walking in the mall and you come past that section in the mall where, there, where there's Victoria's Secret and then La Senza, guys, we need, to be, we need to have an intimate knowledge of the floor tiles outside those, the stores. Look away! Let's not allow those things, as simple and as little as they are, let's have to put seeds in that will grow into monsters. If our electronics are an issue, if it's our computers or our phones or our iPads, I read a thing this week that said, have your electronics spayed or neutered. <laughs> if we know that these things are causing us trouble, 
Let's deal with it. We have a rule in our house that uh, no, no electronics in the bedrooms. We move our computer into right out into the main room where everybody sits. If these are things that cause trouble, let's, let's get the, take the potency out of it. Maybe you think this is too hard. Well, guess what? To be free from something like this, it's going to be hard. And it's going to take work. But what do you want out of the end of it? Do we want to just keep it all secret and rooted? Or do we want to be free? Jim Nolson uh, works with us lots in counseling, and many of you have, have chatted with him. One of the things he says often to people is, when we meet and we're trying to overcome an issue, he says, you're welcome to lie to me. I'll never know. Go ahead and lie all you want. But if you lie to me about what you're dealing with and how it's going, then he says, then I'm going to give you advice based on your lie. And I'll go home and sleep well that night thinking I did great. And you're going to go home and have moved nowhere. Right? What do you want out of this? If you're going to see a counselor, you've got to be brutally honest so you get out there and you actually make distance, move, move forward. If we want to be free, we've got to be truthful about this. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 5.22 says, Stay away from all kinds of evil. We need to avoid dangerous behaviors and dangerous places and dangerous people. James chapter 4, 7 says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. So the first thing, see the lies for what they are. Know the truth. The second thing, avoid the places or the things, the triggers. Run away. Neuter them. Make them ineffective. The problem is, like the filthy ditch water, we get to the place where I'm dying. And all of a sudden, the arguments seem to be logical, and I get duped. Third thing, we need to choose to follow Jesus. Hebrews chapter 12 it talks about our life as living, uh, running a race. And we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Let's run the race set out for it, perseverance. Let's get rid of the things that are holding us back. The sin that so easily entangles us. We can't run a race with our shoes tied together. And yet, allowing these things to, to settle and take root in our heart, even secretly and squash down the wee little bits. They tie our shoes together. We're trying to run a race. And it says, then, um, run with perseverance. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Second Peter chapter 1 says that he has given us everything we need for living a godly life. Do we believe that? 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13 says, The temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. But God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to, to be more than you can stand. And when you're tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. There is always a way out. Now, in Joseph's case, there was a way out. And it was hard. He stood with integrity and ran from sin and spent a lot of time in very difficult days in jail. But look at it from God's perspective over the course of his life how even in jail God was faithful and blessed him and restored him. Where David in his sin was tormented the rest of his life. The enemy is real. He lies and he whispers and he chases and he pursues and he's often relentless. But he has been overcome. Jesus has rescued us. And the enemy has no power over you except what you give him. Do you know that to be true? I was a youth pastor for a lot of years and one of the ways that I would try to explain this to kids in a way they can understand it was like this. Um, imagine that you are in the morning, you're sitting in your kitchen eating your Fruit Loops, and the door right beside you, you hear this little scratch at the door and this little puppy dog whimper. And you look outside, and it is the cutest little puppy dog you've ever seen in your life. And he's whimpering and scratching at the door. Well, what do you do? You open the door, you lean down to pick up the dog, 
And as soon as you lean down, this dog opens up and shows his teeth, and he is on your leg with every bit of his teeth and power just ripping at your flesh. Okay, how do you respond to that? Oh, nice little dog. No, get that thing outside and close the door, right? Next morning, you're eating your breakfast, and you hear this little scratch at the door, and this little whimper, and you open the door, and it, oh, what a cute little dog, same dog as yesterday. You open the door, wham, he's right back on the same wound as yesterday, just chomping with everything he's got. You get the dog back. How many days in a row do you do this? It's pretty obvious when you look at it that way, right? Folks, this is exactly what the enemy does to us. Exactly. And yet day after day after day after day, we swing the door wide open and we get bit again. What if, what if Jesus was sitting in the room with you? Better yet, Jesus is in you. And yet we often ignore his whispers and listen to the lies. Lust is a counterfeit. Lust promises things it cannot deliver. We need to call the lies lies. We need to resist the devil and run. Uh, and we need to keep our eyes on Jesus. And choose to pursue life along the way God promises in God's ways. Because you hold your moral life in your control. Nobody else does. So back to where I started. Living in opposition to God's way. Or living in an opposite direction to God. That's why I want us to understand these issues. To understand lust. To call the lies lies. To examine ourselves in our hearts. To examine our behavior and our attitudes. Especially the secret ones that no one knows. We need to expose them and bring them to light and run to Jesus. In surrender, we find forgiveness and restoration and a new start and freedom and life. Ron Gray, who told the story about the water bottle, said this, God does not call us away from sex so we can give ourselves fully to him. Instead, God calls us to himself so we can experience sex and all his other gifts in their purity and in their fullness and in their sweetest context. Desire is not the problem. The direction is the problem. What leads you? What calls you? What beckons you forward? What causes you to make decisions? What's the basis for your actions? What's the basis for your pursuits? Am I pursuing life, enjoyment, satisfaction, pleasure, happiness in any way that is actually taking me away from Jesus? I choose you, Jesus. Yesterday, Lisa and I were sitting on the beach and she was reading a book about personality types. And um, I, I asked her to take a picture of the quote and send it to me, and she did, but I didn't get it, so I'm going to try to remember. But here, here's the gist of it. I mentioned earlier that the definition of, of lust, to be consumed with desire, craving, coveting, wanting, wishing, longing, yearning, hungering, thirsting, aching, burning for, right? And this book actually said that is the deepest spiritual part of your life because God has created you with a burning longing to fill the holes in our heart a relentlessness in us to crave and drive and push and wish and long and yearn and hunger and thirst but he created us with that so we would seek him and Satan has taken what was a beautiful desire and twisted it around into lust. God created us with this. And only Jesus can fill these voids. We're created to long for him. Only Jesus. Just pray with me. Father, as we look at these seven deadly sins, as they're called, 
God, would you help us to see clearly, to see lies as lies, to know the truth. Help us to run to you. God, change our heart so that even in the deepest places of who we are, where our secrets are held and where we define ourselves and the things we deeply long for and run after and pursue, God, may that be a place in our heart that is completely and totally owned by you. God, would you shine the light inside of us and expose these things that we might run to you in surrender and in forgiveness and in repentance to find cleansing and freedom. You promise all of these things that we fight for are things that you promise us when we surrender to you. Forgive us for our pursuit of these same things in every other direction. God, may we know your fullness, the joy that comes only from you. In Jesus' name, amen.